conscripted into the military at that time. So it was a convenient time for her to avoid conscription. <laughs> yeah, to get out of town, to avoid conscription. Because um, Chava, I think, uh, was not interested in sending her daughter, you know, to be a soldier. You know, uh, it, it, it had no, um, you know, rationale for her. However, her husband, uh, Hersch, he had been a soldier already in 1956. So this whole family came over, you know, and it was very difficult to talk to each other because I didn't speak Hebrew. Well, I, I understood some Hebrew, you know, textual Hebrew, but I didn't speak Hebrew. They didn't speak English, and they didn't speak Yiddish except for Chava. So I was able to speak with Chava, and Chava was able to translate for me, you know, to, the, to their daughters until they learned English. And then um, to Tova, she uh, uh, went back to Israel, uh, married uh, an Israeli who was somewhat religious, you know, with a beard and all that, and they went to live in Beersheba, and, uh, and who let it be known to me through her family that they didn't want me to come to visit them because uh, they didn't want me to jeopardize their social status in Israel because she um, and her husband wanted to encourage their family, their children, to go and do their military service, even though she herself had avoided the military service. And they didn't want their um, promotion, uh, promotions in the military to be jeopardized by uh, any association with anybody who would be considered a critic you know, of the Israeli government. So by then, your reputation in the family seemed to have been well circulating. Yes. You see, because, you know, like I came from a Bundist background, um, the Bundist Jewish uh, population, which was predominant amongst the refugees, were not, uh, uh, you know, ideological in the sense that they followed, you know, the Zionist uh, political parties in Europe at the time, which were generally Western European a uh, Western European phenomenon. And they were, uh, the Zionist parties were situated more so in Germany, Austria, France, and they existed because of the disillusionment with the lack of uh, opportunities for Jewish uh, citizens in those countries. And in fact, with the repression that was uh, inflicted upon the uh, Jewish population. In particular, this developed as a phenomenon uh, by the rationale that was generated by the Dreyfus case in France, when a Jewish officer, who most likely had converted to Christianity in the first place because officers were required to be Christian, so he, he was a Jewish Christian officer in the French military, but because he had some relative, you know, as well in Germany, he was immediately suspected above all else, above, above all other, you know, possibilities, as being the informer, you know, uh, um, in terms of military intelligence, a spy, you know, for the German military. It was later found out that there was a, uh, another uh, Frenchman who was an officer who had relatives in Germany as well, who turned out to be the uh, actual, you know, spy. But uh, Dreyfus was blamed for this, and uh, uh, it turned into a big scandal. So this generated, you know, disillusionment, you know, with the, um, the prospects for integration or assimilation that was created by the Napoleonic Code, which gave uh, citizenship and equal rights to the Jewish-French uh, inhabitants, uh, who prior to the Napoleonic Code, and even during the French Revolution, were not granted you know, equal voting rights to other you know, Frenchmen and French women. But women didn't have a vote at that time in any case. So, um, you know, the, the Western sort of liberal tradition didn't work for the Jewish people. The Zionism, though, considered that if this was the default condition, and if the European you know, uh, countries were formed as nation states, uh, either in the German model of Hegel, or in the French model, in which uh, nationality was defined in a certain social context, rather than a simple legal context, therefore they said, well, if it's not going to work in either the German or the French context, there is no other context. Therefore, Jewish people cannot be equal citizens in the European context. And therefore, they said, the only thing to do is to establish another country in which Jews can be the majority, determine for themselves what the legal and social criteria will be, 
and therefore uh, establish equal rights for the Jewish people. This was the political strategy of the Zionist movement. In Eastern Europe, however, the Jewish uh, working class, who were more uh, lower class, working class people, and not middle class people, as in the uh, Western European context, were seeking um, rights more so in terms of workers, as workers, you know, uh, in terms of you know their, their wages, so they formed unions. In terms of civil rights, they were a civil rights movement more than a um, independence movement. So this Bundesparty uh, formed up unions and social organizations and a whole network of civil society on its own, which was not provided for by the uh, existing government. And uh, they, um, you know, had elections in, in municipalities, you know, in the Warsaw and, and the other uh, cities, in which the Bund, you know, was uh, the, predominantly fa favored, you know, by the uh, Jewish population at that time. And they did not support, you know, an independent Jewish country because they considered themselves to be Polish in addition to being Jewish. And they didn't want to leave their home country, which was Poland, or Russia, or Lithuania, for that matter. So, they wanted to have, you know, the rights equal to other citizens, and that's why they formed up this Bund, Bund which means alliance or union. So, completely different political culture. Now, of the refugees, the majority of them were Bundes, because uh, that's where the larger Jewish population was in the first place. And, uh, and that's, and also because uh, they were the, the ones, the Jewish population, who had the least opportunity to escape, other than, you know, walking across the border into Russia if they happened to be close to Russia. So, um, in the refugee camps, uh, the Zionist parties came in under the sponsorship of the American military uh, administration, and they did their propaganda trip, and they were trying to convince, you know, these refugees to go to Palestine. My father told me that he refused, because, one, he was orthodox, and he didn't consider Israel to be Jewish because the uh, Zionist party leaderships were generally secular, if not a atheist, and they are establishing a country on the French model, you know, the civil society, civil citizenship model, in which um, everyone was a citizen on the basis of, of being a resident uh, of the territory and not on the basis of their religion. The law was a secular law, it wasn't the Jewish law, etc. And so my father didn't want to go for that reason. Also, he said he didn't want to go into another war. He didn't want to be a soldier. And all the refugees who were recruited to go to Palestine oh, knew that they would be obliged to become soldiers and fight against the indigenous population in order to secure as much territory as they could, you know, for their own project, you know, the Zionist project. And your mother was like-minded? My mother was a Bundist, more so than my father. My father wasn't even a Bundist, you see, because you know, he came from a more religious, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, city, Lublin, which was, you know, more country uh, oriented. And, uh, but he was nonetheless anti-Zionist for religious reasons. My mother was anti-Zionist for political reasons. But, uh, so they were compatible to a certain extent for, for that. But uh, uh, my mother wasn't very religious in practice, you know, she never went to synagogue every week type thing. Um, but she kept Shabbos, you know, and we did the, you know, Shabbos, you know, uh, uh, meal Shabbos and candles, uh, you know, every week. So of the Jewish refugee population, only 42% actually went to Palestine. And they were generally those who didn't have the opportunity to get a visa to go and uh, settle in any other country. 58% got visas to go to Canada and the United States, basically Canada and the United States, and South America. So, um, the general will was not to go to Palestine, and, but rather to go to a, you know, a country that was peaceful, that was prosperous, and that offered you know, the best opportunities to reestablish their life. So, I you know, was aware of all this, and I developed this into a political critique after the uh, War of 1967. Uh, which struck me very hard, and I didn't know what to think, you know, because there was a lot of sort of, you know, euphoria, you know, because Israel had won this war, and there was so much, you know, respect being showered upon Israel, and in consequence on the Jewish people. So I was working, you know, as a lifeguard for the city of Toronto, and the supervisor, who had never spoken a word to me before, 
all of a sudden just one day walks up to me and says, congratulations on winning the war in Israel. And you know, like, uh, and, uh, you know, I didn't even know the guy, you know, like, and I had nothing to say to him, you know, I was like shocked. And, and, and also very confused, you know, so I had to sort of, you know, like research the matter for myself. So one day it was, you know, rainy, cold day, there was nobody on the beach, you know, I was the lifeguard on one of the beaches on the, on the Toronto Islands there. And so I, w I finished my lunch, you know, and we used to work 10 hour shifts, you know, from 10 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night and uh, got very boring. And there was nobody there that day. So when I dumped my um, garbage bag, in, uh, my lunch bag into the garbage, there was a newspaper there from that day. So I picked it up, you know, and I started reading all the uh, reports, you know, about what had happened, what was happening in the war. And I got so enthralled, you know, uh, I mean, I would look up occasionally to see if there was anybody in the beach, but there wasn't. So I kept on reading. And then the uh, supervisor, I don't think it was the same supervisor, although it could have been the same supervisor who had congratulated me previously. He goes, you know, he was going out in his motorboat, you know, on a lake, you know, to, to check on the lifeguards to make sure that we were doing our duty. And he saw me, and he uh, came into uh, to the beach, cut his motor so I couldn't hear him, drifted into the beach, walked out of his boat, walked right up to me, right in front of me, and I still hadn't noticed him. And he, and he said, you know, you're, you're under report for reading a newspaper while working. Okay. So then I go to the lieutenant. You know, we were called the Toronto Harbor Police. We were a militarized uh, unit. And I go in there and he says, and he said to me, this guy was very hard, hardcore, this guy, this uh, lieutenant. And he said to me, uh, what are you here for? And I said, oh, well, I was reported to, uh, for having you know, been reading a newspaper you know, while, uh, while on duty. And he said, okay, you're fired, just like that. You know, he didn't even give me a chance to explain you know, like why I was doing this and the context in which there was nobody there. So I got fired because of the war of 1967. But this gave me time you know, to read more about what was going on. And, uh, and the next summer, I, I went back and requalified and got the job back, you know. And then the same lieutenant, who was very well known for his, uh, you know, his perfect memory, uh, turned to me when I was going, being processed and said, "Don't I know you?" <laughs> Absolutely not. And I said, "Oh, you must mean my cousin. I always used to trade identities with my cousin Harvey, Harvey Weisfeld, you know, because uh, it helped. It was convenient. It was convenient. But I'm always struck by the fact that the way that you learn information." is never by your circle of friends or your family. There's no discussion. In your other interview as well, it's through watching TV. Something suddenly gets parachuted without any context for you to have been able to mm -hmm. engage mm -hmm. or make sense of it or have any appreciation. It's, again, this is like the third edition. It's either the Eichmann trials that are getting splashed all over the news that you have to say what is yeah. going on or in the description that you gave yes. about the um, in in Toronto, you were you were talking about uh, there was somebody who was um, some kind of neo-Nazi uh, Holocaust yeah. uh, denier, mm -hmm. and and that again made you question what is this? Yeah. So again, it's the random person who's congratulating you in a completely different yes. uh, situation that illuminates the fact that here. Yes. Uh, so it's extraordinary, this sense of complete uh, separation. Um, Except for my mother. My mother was my secret collaborator. She, uh -huh. she told me, you know, what, uh, what she thought about uh, the Zionists, you know, because when I was a young kid, you know, about eight years old, the right-wing Zionist movement uh, formed a, um, a, a Jewish boys club on the same street. And because I wanted to find friends, you know, the same age, I went and joined this club. And this club was called the Bnei Akiva, which is the right-wing Zionist, you know, uh, political party, which is affiliated with the, what we call the Likud party in, in Israel now. So I was a member of the youth movement of the Likud party, even though I was still a Bundist, you know. And I told my mother that there was this club and I was going to join it. And she told me, oh, you shouldn't join this, you know, like this is, you know, the right wingers, you know. And I said, oh, I'm not joining it, you know, because I, I you know, support, you know, their ideology and you know, I, I just want to, you know, hang out with some friends. But then they started to get heavy with us, you know, and they were trying to indoctrinate us after a while, besides, you know, doing, you know, a social trip with us. 
And then they brought us every Friday night, you know, they would bring us up to the second floor in the little room, and they said this was a synagogue, and they were going to hold a service there, and that we would have to participate in order, you know, as a membership criteria. And that they were turning it into, you know, like a, um, a religious mm -hmm. criteria to be a member, okay. So, which I thought was ridiculous, because how can you turn a room into a synagogue? You know, a synagogue can't be a room, you know, like a synagogue has to have, you know, a, has to have an ark, you know, with a Torah in it, you know, if it doesn't have a Torah, it's not a synagogue, that's it, that's all, you know, like I was Orthodox, you know, like 100%. So, you know, nonetheless, I had to sit there, you know, this little room, you know, and then these people, you know, like who, you know, didn't have any religious sort of training, you know, you know, they weren't, you know, a rabbi or anything like that, they were sort of pretend rabbis, you know, and they started sort of, you know, reading all this stuff, and to me it was so ridiculous, I started laughing. And then, you know, and I would tell the other kids, you know, the other boys, uh, you know, this is ridiculous, you can't, you know, <laughs> do this, you know, it's, it's sacrilegious. And I would laugh, and I couldn't help myself from laughing, and then I got expelled. I was expelled into the hallway, you know, so that I wouldn't contaminate the other boys. So this was my first sort of, you know, intervention at the, about the age of eight. Oh, you were eight? You were yeah. only eight? Yes. Yeah. And this is a youth, youth group. So then, um, after the 1967 war, uh, I was a socialist by default, and I joined the NDP in order to be politically active. And uh, then the 67 war happened, and I realized this was very important. And um, the Labour Party government, which was responsible for the occupation of the uh, West Bank and the Gaza, and the Golan Heights of Syria, and uh, I don't think that they occupied any part of Lebanon at that time. Nonetheless, you know, uh, and then they were saying that this was a temporary occupation, but I was very skeptical about that, and uh, I assumed that something, you know, wrong was happening here, and then I educated myself as much as possible, and then I was, I, I met up with the local Palestinian leadership. Khaled Muammar, who later became the president of the Canadian Arab Federation, and uh, who uh, is on the refugee board of Canada in the Toronto area. And uh, he invited me to come and speak at the Palestinian demonstrations. And I was the only Jewish person in the whole city who would dare to speak out in public against the occupation at that time. And I was like 18, 19 years old. So it was very traumatic, you know. Uh, very sort of you know emotionally sort of stressful uh, thing to do, and I became very well known about this. I was denounced, you know, by the uh, regular sort of you know Jewish organizations that had all been taken over by the Zionist parties and by the uh, Jewish media, which was generally uh, very favorable to Israel because of this euphoria of having won the war. And uh, I was denounced. I was even denounced in the Jewish uh, school system in Toronto when the Jewish, uh, the Hebrew Board of Education told all the teachers to denounce me by name to all the students, telling them not to listen to me. But, in effect, they informed all the students, you know, that there was this, you know, Jewish opposition. Activist. How did your parents deal with this at the time? Were they accepting and... My father was afraid of the Zionist pressure. My mother, she, she said that there was nothing in it for me, you know, and, I, uh, and that, you know, I was, I was taking a lot of chances, you know, doing this sort of work. So she was concerned? She was, so she was concerned for me on a personal level. Mm -hmm. But what happened in the family is what's very important. In the uh, Pesach Seder, you know, the Passover, you know, family meal in the spring of 1976, the uncle that my sister married in Israel, who was still living in Toronto, and still lives in Toronto, Hersch, Hersch Feinzelber, who was a soldier in 1956, he would denounce me in the family meal there, even though he wasn't, you know, a primary member of the family. There were the visitors from... He, by then they had Yeah, he was spent um, a relation by marriage, mm -hmm. you know. And he was the one, because he was a soldier, he had to, had to sort of, you know, continue his, you know, military campaign. And he did this, you know, by denouncing me in front of the family, you know. After we went through the, you know, the first, you know, ceremony, then there would be sort of, you know, a lull. Reset the table. Eats, and yeah, him. and at that point, every Seder, you know, he would start arguing with me. And the way it would start off would be like this. He would say, ah, so why are you a traitor? This is his, 
you know, opening Open the mark. Hmm. And now I, I would, you know, remain, you know, very friendly, and I would start to explain that I'm not a traitor, and that I, you know, consider this to be, you know, a political error, and it's a political question, and it's not a question, you know, of being a traitor to the Jewish people. And uh, he would sort of argue, and he would start shouting, you know, and then finally, my, uh, my, uh, my other uncle, my father's brother, uh, Harry Hirsch, he, who was the like master of ceremonies, you know, for the seder, mm -hmm. you know, because it was his house, and you know, he was leading the seder, and he was, you know, doing all the recitations and everything like this, you know. At one point, you know, after it got to be rather boring, uh, to for him to come back with the same remarks again and again, he would say, "Okay, now it's no. time to sing," and then everybody would sing, and then the, we would end off the seder, and then everybody would be happy again. It was bizarre. So this went on for two or three seders, but in the seder of '76. My um, cousin Helen, Helen Daniels, actually, who was in the leadership of the Canadian Jewish Congress in the Community uh, Relations Committee, she felt embarrassed, you know, by my political activities, and she felt provoked, you know, by the uh, by my defense, you know, in the meal in front of everybody, you know, against you know the accusations of my um, Isra Israeli soldier uncle, that she called up um, the um, Toby. Who's, who was making the Seder, and asked her to call up my parents to tell me not to come, that I was expelled from the family, because it was, you know, causing too much trouble, even though I didn't raise, you know, all these matters, you know, it was this uncle. So, my parents, you know, were shocked. My mother told me this. I spoke with my Aunt Toby. She told me that, you know, she was asked to do this, you know, by Helen. And she was embarrassed to do so, but you know she didn't she want Helen not to come to the seder. She wanted Helen to be present, and Helen was threatening to boycott the seder if and I that's... wasn't expelled. So, she, uh, so she was asking me to kindly not come. So I said, okay, I won't come. But my parents didn't like it that this cousin, who was younger than them, and who was also Canadian and not a refugee, you know, was interfering in the family like this and pretending to to be the leader of the family which is contrary, you know, to in, in Jewish religious culture, it's the older, the elder generation who are the leaders of the family and not the younger. Especially not, you know, because, you know, my parents were working class and she came from a middle class family. And she was married into a middle class, you know, lower bourgeois kind of uh, family. So, you know, from a socialist point of view, you know, they had to, you know, like they were, in, and there was a great deal of indignation, you know, that this, you know, middle class, you know, person would declare them, you know, what the policy was going to be for the family as a whole. So, each of my parents decided to boycott the, uh, the family Seder. So my parents and I had our own Seder, and so the family split, and was split forever after that. Never reunited in the family Passover Seder again, because of my Israeli uncle. And this Israeli uncle, he told me in private one time that in 1956 he was ordered to and did participate in the execution of Egyptian prisoners of war who didn't have any arms, you know, who were, you know, uh, captured uh, prisoners of war, and he helped to execute them contrary to international law and a, uh, contrary to the Geneva Convention on, on, the, on, on, on law with respect to conflict. And when he told me this, you know, his daughter was coming over to speak with us, and as soon as she came over, he quieted up, he didn't say anything anymore. Mm -hmm. So I don't think he had even told his daughter directly, or perhaps anybody else. But to me, he did. And why? Because he wanted me to sympathize with him, in a way, and try to sort of, you know, get my, get a sense of complicity on my part with his action, because he, he was, trying to sort of imply that it was a necessary action, that he, was, he felt embarrassed about it, but he still f seemed to think that it was necessary, and that he was explaining to me, you know, how a war is fought, and uh, why it's necessary t to uh, commit crimes in a war in order to win the war, and that the most important thing is to win, because these uh, men could have been soldiers in some future war. How did you and your parents ever come to terms with such a terrible trauma of being disassociated from their family, the small family that you were, that... Oh, they took it out on each other. How know? so? 
Oh, they used they to yell blame? at each other every every day. You know, they'd yell at each other for any little thing. You know, they'd sort of you know try to raise their own sense of self-esteem by diminishing the self-esteem of the other. But that's what was done to all of you. You know. Yes. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're perpetrating this, you know, I'm the victim of what you're doing to me. Yes. Yeah, you I, seem I to have it's... become, uh, for whatever reason, yeah, I couldn't the take target that, uh, and the scapegoat. Yeah, no, I couldn't take all that. So I left my parents' home at the age of 19 as soon as I got my student loan and grant to go to university. I got myself a room and, and I left. And uh, I didn't, and I was, um, um, my father, uh, um, ostracized me, you know, like cut me off completely, so I didn't have any financial support, so I only lived on the student loan and grants, which was so limited, you know, like I used to run out of money for food at the end of the oh. school year, you know, at the exam time, you know, I wouldn't have money to buy food. <laughs> and your mother, how did she ever... My mother didn't have any money at the time. No, know? in terms of emotionally, how did she ever accept that her... Oh, she, her she, was, child who she, was, a... she was afraid of my father. So she wouldn't, you know, try to convince him otherwise. Because my father w could become violent. You know, he would hit her. Uh, not beat her, but he would hit her enough, you know, that would create fear. That's what he was intending to do. When I was old enough at home, and I finally w was big enough, one time he came to hit me, and I finally sort of, you know, him. stood up to him, and I, and, and, and I, and, you know, I was going to fight him back, you know, if he was going to hit me. And he turned to me and he was so shocked and he said, what, you would hit your own father? And I said, yes, <laughs> I would. Yeah. And so he backed off and he never hit me again. Yeah. I think he didn't hit my mother again after that as well. You know, but, uh, you know, he had the, uh, the Jewish male mentality, orthodox mentality that, you know, the male, you know, orders, you know, all the other members of the family on what to do. Did he, you ever find a way to get back together? My father? Oh yeah, I mean, like, I mean, after you left home and after you were distant from them. Well, you know, yeah, we would get together, you know, uh, when I was comfortable to do so, you know, for Pesach, you know, certainly for Pesach. But not emotionally, you. you... Oh yes, emotionally we had a bond, you know, because we were all refugees, mm -hmm. you know, like we still had that strong link, nonetheless. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, a very contradictory thing. And then, <laughs> one time, you know. Um, my name was so well known, but I didn't have, you know, a telephone number. I didn't have any money to have a telephone. So I had no telephone number registered in my name. So some Zionists, you know, thought that uh, I deserved to be assassinated. So they called up my father's telephone number, you know, because it was Weisfeld. And they said, you know, that they, you know, wanted to kill me, you know. So my father replies, says, what are you calling me for? You know, he doesn't live here. I have nothing to do with him, you know, like, do what you want, you know, leave me alone. That's all he cared about, you know. And then he tells me about this telephone conversation, how he told them, you know, to do whatever they wanted, you know, like it had nothing to do with him. So, and then when I did use my tel the telephone number that I lived at, you know, for political organizing as a public number, I used to get uh, telephone calls mm -hmm. from some Zionist fanatics who would call me up, you know, to issue threats, uh, you know, death threats. So I would talk to them and try to sort of, you know, make them aware of what they were doing, you know, because they had. They had no idea, you know, what they were doing. They were sort of reacting like robots, you know. And so, and then I would speak to them in Yiddish and explain to them, you know, that they were mm -hmm. talking with a Jewish person. Mm -hmm. And uh, one guy who called me up to, to give me a death threat, you know, like, it, it was a telephone call I received just as I was about to go out the door to go visit my mother. So, you know, I, the final thing, you know, that finally sort of calmed him down and let me, you know, mm -hmm. end the conversation was that I told him, look, I, I can't keep on talking with you, you know, I, because I have to go and visit my mother, or my mother's waiting for me, you know. <laughs> so that was, you know, that helped to resolve that particular sort of death threat. You made reference last time when uh, Sally, your son, was here. In Sally. Sally, you, yeah. you said that you were very critical towards him, that you had your own difficult years, and you were happy that you seemed to have been able to find a way past that. What did, what, did, what did you mean by that when you said you were critical towards him? Uh, when you're a poor refugee kid, you know, you can't afford to make any mistakes. Mm -hmm. You make one mistake and it's a disaster. You know, like, if you run out of money, you don't have food. If you, uh, um, 
if you, if you don't have a certain sense of self-esteem, uh, somebody will attack you for who you are if they think they can get away with it. You know, so if you end up, you know, getting attacked, then I would I would question them and say, well, what did you do beforehand? You know, how did it happen? How did this you know circumstance evolve? You know, so he felt like I was criticizing him for not reacting in a proper manner and that I was accusing him of being the cause of the attack upon him, which I, I wasn't really trying to do. I was just examining it in a critical fashion in order to to grab hold of the situation and resolve it, you know, so that it won't happen again. So, but for a young kid, you no, know, they like, don't it's very difficult. They, they that your understand. intention was to protect, but no, somehow no. he saw it as that you were yeah. looking for weakness or blame. What yes. did he do to well, he felt like blaming the victim? Or, he felt like he was weak. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and, you know, being so isolated, yes, he was mm -hmm. in a very weak uh, situation, yeah. And you saw his vulnerability and didn't So I tried to teach him on how to overcome this, you know, how to find allies and how to uh, present yourself so that, you know, a person doesn't think they can get away with, you know, mm -hmm. like beating you and, and how to defend yourself. So we would train, you know, in fighting techniques mm -hmm. and then we would do practice fighting, uh, all this sort of, you know, this way, uh, this culture of survival, mm -hmm. yeah. So the family broke up, and uh, and then you know, uh, but I continued, you know, because there was hardly anybody else who would speak up in Toronto. So I became very well known in Toronto for being a dissident uh, Jewish spokesperson. And then even in my studies, I started off, you know, by at the University of Toronto and at the University of Waterloo studying physics and uh, 